Adrian Grieve is an associate professor of city and regional planning at California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. She was the project manager and co-PI for development of the California Adaptation Planning Guide, has led studio courses that assisted California communities in preparing their climate action plans, and continues to, continues to conduct research on climate action plan development and implementation. She earned her PhD in an interdisciplinary program in urban design and planning at the UW, where she also taught an introduction to urban ecology and field-based urban ecology. She has worked on urban stream management, hydrology, and the identification of placement options for natural drainage systems, both for SPU and evaluated the effects of land cover on urban stream time for concentra of, of concentration for King County. Her book, the one I referred to before, is called Local Climate Action Planning, and it's co-written with Michael Boswell and Tammy Seal. Our other panelists this evening include Brendan Williams, the Deputy Insurance Commissioner of the Washington State Office of the Insurance Commissioner. He supervises policy and legislative affairs there, and as you probably know, he's a former three-term state representative from Olympia and a frequent, I have columnists written here, that's not enough, voice, passionate voice on progressive issues. Casey Golden is a policy director for Climate Solutions, the policy director for Climate Solutions, the pioneering leading edge state and local climate policies while helping de deliver strong regional support for responsible national and international policy. A 2012 winner of the Heinz Award for Public Policy, he has more than 20 years experience in Northwest energy and climate issues in the public and nonprofit sectors. Our moderator tonight is Andy Wappler, Vice President of Corporate Affairs for Puget Sound Energy and a former broadcaster certified by the American Meteorological Society. He now leads the utilities community relations and energy efficiency programs with an emphasis on helping local residential and business customers better understand and use new technologies for the wise use of clean renewable resources of energy, sources of energy. So after all of that tongue twisting, and I apologize, please give a warm town hall welcome to this terrific panel. terrific panel and he undersold them they're not a terrific panel they're a fabulous panel they're the best panel in this room right now <laughs> well thank you all very much for coming out tonight on a, a lovely and typical rainy December evening would you have expected anything less and I know for many of you this was kind of a double header you were just down the street maybe at the convention center so you've been certainly spending much of your day mm -hmm. thinking about these issues and speaking out about these issues we have some uh, great information here tonight on a subject that I think is extremely timely, especially given what we just saw on the East Coast, uh, Superstorm Sandy. And certainly a major event. Actually, my brother lives in Connecticut. He was out of power for eight days. He was not that excited about it, but he knows he was one of the lucky ones because for him, that storm was an inconvenience. It wasn't a life-changing event. It wasn't something that took away years of work at a business or years of memories at his home. It just meant kind of a dark week with crabby kids because the power wasn't on. So he knows he got off fairly lucky. But certainly that storm should be a wake-up call for those who aren't awake or maybe another reason for those who are already aware that action needs to be taken and really needs to be taken now. And what we hope to be able to do here tonight is look at a number of facets of this. Um, Adrienne, in her book, Local Climate Action Planning, begins with a a little quote here that I'll read from someone you might know, Greg Nichols, former Seattle mayor. It says, global warming is real and demands our immediate response. It is in our national interest to act now, and mayors understand the successful plan in this country for reducing our energy consumption begins in cities and local communities. We are leading by example in the fight against global warming and representing America to the world. Greg Nichols, when he was president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And of course, energy is a large component of what Adrienne talks about in her book, but there's a lot more to it than that in terms of the idea of climate adaptation and being ready. It isn't just your energy use, it's all kinds of things in your community. And with that, I'll turn it over to Adrienne, who'll give us, she typically teaches a 10-week course in four-hour segments, and there will be a test. Uh, later this evening. <laughs> so we're going to try and do the quick version. So imagine 10 weeks of your life going by in about 20 minutes. <laughs> Talk fast. <Yes. laughs> so yeah, the, the short course on climate planning. Um, 
So I guess my role today um, is to basically introduce the topics so we're all starting from the same place. So it's kind of to kind of set the introduction for all the topics. If I can get this to advance <laughs> somehow. Okay. So a quick overview um, about kind of what's happening nationally in terms of communities that are pursuing climate planning. Um, and then greenhouse gas emission reduction. What are some of the basic steps to developing policy to address that issue? And then adaptation. And then I'm, we're gonna leave kind of the examples and some of the on the ground application for the other panelists. So what exactly is a CAP? Um, they come in, CAP being Climate Action Plan, uh, they come in all different shapes and sizes and they look different. They have different names, they have different numbers of chapters. There's no real rules yet on how exactly you write them. So they're often contextual. That said, um, they are strategic plans. They do one of two things. One of the things they do is reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's largely the burning of fossil fuels to heat your home, to run your vehicles. It's also off-gassing off from solid waste. They also um, increase your resilience to the impacts of climate change. This is also called adaptation or the unavoidable consequences of climate change. So it's kind of a dual purpose for these plans. Now we talked about the Conference of Mayors and there's the U.S. Mayors Protection Agreement. As of yesterday, um, there are 1,054 signatures of that agreement. This is an agreement to pursue climate planning in the future, to inventory your emissions and to about, adopt policy to reduce them. That said, and there is no national database for all the cities that have done this, but as best we can tell, there's somewhere in the low 200s. So out of the over 1,000 mayors that have vowed to take action, only in the low 200s have actually adopted a freestanding climate plan. Now, this, I should say, there's no one size fits all, the type of community that does this. This is everything from almost 4 million to just 2,000 people. So Homer, Alaska to New York City um, that have adopted these plans. The median size, some around 80,000, but that does represent 10 of the 15 largest cities in the U.S. It represents, um, well, 13% of the population in just those 200 some odd cities. So this does have national consequences. In terms of the overall emissions, just those 200 some odd cities, um, it's already 8% of the national emissions. So it, does it have consequences? Absolutely. We, it's critical that cities are taking action. The majority of our national emissions are associated with cities. That said, and we're still on the steep side of the learning curve. So if you take those 200 plans and look at, well, when were they adopted? We're growing, and you'll see that the light colored column, that's the in process. Meaning after the turn of the year, we'll probably go back and check all of the websites and call up those cities to ask them, has it been adopted? And the 2012 is probably gonna jump significantly. So we're on the steep side of that learning curve still. And so there's thousands of cities in the US and there's only in the low 200s that have adopted this plan to do this. So we are going to see this increasing and growing through time. So greenhouse gas reduction, this is something that's probably most commonly understood. Um, at least in the general public and also by city planners and officials. And generally speaking, the steps, there's preliminary activities. This is convincing your elected officials um, and advisory boards that it's a good idea. You can't pursue a climate plan until you actually take civic action to say this is a priority to do it. That's also creating public outreach, and outreach not just to the public but also internal to city government because you need everyone on board. Um, a good climate plan is going to engage multiple departments well beyond the planning department. So hazards, utilities, transportation and circulation, housing, they should all be involved. And so all these preliminary steps need to be in place before you kind of launch into going through a full planning process. Then it's where are we? How much are we emitting now? Then decide where do we want to go? So visioning and goals, identifying a target, then develop strategies on how to reach that target. And we'll talk through each of these. The one trick and one unique thing about climate planning is it's this, the one plan where for each strategy that you identify in your plan, you need to actually quantify it to demonstrate that you will 
get your target. So it can't be this loose language. It actually has to say, to do this, this many more people need to bike, or this many buildings need to be retrofit for energy efficiency. So it actually demands that you demonstrate exactly how that plan will work, which is a little bit different than a lot of the other kind of guidance documents you see in city government. So the emission sources, um, and the flip side of this is often where you're going to develop policy to reduce emissions, but in terms of measuring how much are we emitting now for greenhouse gases, it's transportation, it's the efficiency of your buildings, how much energy is being consumed to heat and cool buildings, and then it's how is the energy being made, is it coal-based, as I know is an issue today, is it renewable, is it from natural gas, um, and then water, it takes a huge amount of energy to move and treat water. It tends to be a big energy consumer. Um, agriculture is increasingly um, both a source and a sink for greenhouse gases, and then solid waste. The inventories, you often see pie charts. This is for Anacortis. Um, there are many planners that are deciding we need a more engaging way of presenting this information, but pie charts <laughs> seem to be the leading <laughs> communication tool. Um, <laughs> After you have this baseline is you project, well, what will this look like in 2030? What will this look like in, in 2050? If we do nothing, so it's called the business as usual. And then you set a target, and the difference between that business as usual projection and your reduction target, that's what your cap has to do. That's all the measures need to drop your emissions by that amount. So once you have a target and you've actually quantified how much we need to reduce our emissions, they fit, and as I said, there's no standard for how you organize these things. There's the four on the, that's the left. Um, that's from one climate plan, the chapters. The list on the right, that's the chapters from a different climate plan. You can organize them however you please. Um, but you tend to see transportation, land use, energy efficiency, renewable energy, often solid waste, sometimes public participation or education, a lot of times water carbon sequestration, and it'll depend on the community as well. The inventory should be your guiding document, in a sense. So I worked with a community where 98% of their emissions were industrial. They had an industrial chapter. You'd better. <laughs> um, even if you took away their refinery, it was still 75% industrial. They had to have an industrial chapter. Most communities don't, but that community did. So you can start to frame it to really reflect what's in your inventory, and it should be tailored. Really good plans are contextual and recognizing the value system and the needs and the local economy and local culture of the community in which it was written. So once you have any of these, it splits into a lot of different items. So if you just take energy efficiency, that will turn into policy that addresses things like existing buildings. That could be um, energy efficient appliance replacement programs, new buildings, green building. Um, or solar incentive programs. Um, urban cooling, so tree planting, there's a host of strategies, and all of these will have their own set of strategies within a plan. So you'll wanna make sure you break it down, and you should tailor them to what's gonna be most effective. I live in a town that grows on average 0.5% a year. A new construction green building ordinance will have almost no effect, because we're not growing. So it has to be an existing building kind of strategy. So you need to tailor to the needs. If you're a rapidly growing community, absolutely. A new construction green building ordinance makes perfect sense. But the policies you choose here have to reflect the needs and character of the community. Okay, the other half is adaptation to unavoidable. And I think we brought up Sandy. And I thought I would bring up, this is Staten Island. Um, the black and white is from a 1969 publication by Ian McCarg, a fairly famous landscape architect. The dark colors are areas unsuitable for urbanization. Um, on the right are the evacuation zones from Hurricane Sandy. Um, if you overlay them, it's almost perfect. Mm -hmm. Adaptation is kind of about this, honestly. It's about identifying the areas that may be vulnerable but knowing isn't enough. So adaptation <laughs> is about saying, okay, we know. How do you take that knowledge and translate it into smart policy? 
How do you translate that risk into tangible, relatable, and c communicable ideas to a public or to an elected official to actually take action that makes sense? So that you're not gonna prevent the event, how do you minimize the extent to which um, lives are lost, properties damaged, and other almost irreversible impacts? And that's really the, Im the important piece of adaptation. This one is partly to communicate why it's not an either or a game. And a lot of times, politically, you'll hear people say adaptation is giving up on greenhouse gas reduction. And it's really not. They're kind of two sides of the same coin, and we need to pursue both. And what this shows you is the three colors are emission scenarios. So red is everyone drives a Hummer and we decide all our energy should come from coal, kind of worst case scenario. And the yellow being a best case scenario. We go renewable, we all get a Prius or we walk kind of scenario. So that's the range. And we aren't really sure. We're somewhere in the middle right now um, where we're gonna be by the turn of the century. But the important thing here is you don't start to see separation between the three emission scenarios for 50 years. Meaning we've got 30 to 50 years of climate impacts where no amount of greenhouse gas reduction is going to, to stop them. That's why you hear this idea of unavoidable impacts. Do we need to reduce our emissions now? Absolutely. Because at the later in this century, the consequences of not will be severe. But there's changes that we can't stop because a lot of carbon, CO2 hangs out in the atmosphere there's a range, but often upwards to 100 years or more. So we're actually paying for emissions that are quite a bit older. But this is one way of keeping that in mind. The other challenge with adaptation is it's different everywhere. We all share kind of greenhouse gas emissions globally, but adaptation is a local issue, even more than kind of reducing greenhouse gases. There's a huge amount of environmental and biophysical diversity in any state. Adaptation means something very different in Yakima than it means in Anacortes, for example. Um, and so you have to have very different approaches in each of those settings, politically, culturally, in terms of your economic base. An impact will actually have very different consequences and the ripple effect through social, economic, and political ramifications in each of these contexts. So that actually adds some well, challenges and also requires some creativity. Jurisdictional control is another challenge. Cities control land use. They often control their own utility, and so those are things they control. There are other things they can't, or the scale is too big. So Washington has an, an ocean acidification plan that just came out. Um, it's very good. It's probably the best ocean acidification plan I've ever read. Um, which is wonderful. However, for a small community that relies on an oyster farm, they can take some of those actions. That small community is not going to solve ocean acidification. They still may have economic consequences. Adaptation may mean taking action to the extent they can to address ocean acidification. It also may mean recognizing they should diversify their economy. So if you do lose the oyster farms, the ripple effect throughout the rest of your community is dampened. So that can be adaptation as well. Uh, there's also trying to develop policy, some of which can be costly in the face of uncertainty. There's air bars on the climate models, and we don't exactly know how much we're gonna emit in the future, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't take action. Um, but that often gives politicians and policymakers pause, because sometimes you need to actually justify in the face of uncertainty. And so most of what I'm gonna talk about now is how do you do that? Um, if you have an odds on something like hurricane sanding, even if it's less than half, how do you decide to do that? Um, the first step is literally that McCard map. What does climate change mean here? This is exposure. That's the NOAA sea level rise map for Grace Harbor. Um, but you should take a look at the available science and increasingly you have good science. And ask how different is it from current conditions. In California, Southern California, not shockingly, is still going to burn in 2100. But it's not all that different from the fact that wildfire occurrence now. Northern California is expected to have an eight to 10 times increase in wildfire risk. Northern California doesn't have building codes, emergency services, and all of the other 
policy you would have in place to address wildfire to the same extent as Southern California. So the difference from current is a much bigger deal um, for Northern California. And so that's one of the big questions to ask yourself when looking at exposure. Um, how quickly is it going to happen? Is this something that's projected by, the by mid-century, end of the century? How fast? Um, how spatially variant? Is this something that's just about one estuary, one um, particular beach area, one coast or um, mountain range? Or is it something that's a little bit more spatially kind of shared? The extent of the impact um, and how sure? And not all climate impacts have equal levels of certainty. Sea level rise it has a very high level of certainty. Changes in precipitation pattern, there's a lower level of certainty. Some areas are projected to get more, some areas less. Some areas the same amount, it's just distributed very differently throughout the season, but there is a lower level of certainty, but that's one thing to consider as well. The next question is just a yes, no. Sensitivity is just to say, okay, well, if that does happen, does it matter? And so it can be, which functions? Is this emergency services, economic continuity, government continuity, kind of the basic functions that make your city work? And then structures. And this isn't just the buildings. This is also infrastructure. So roadways, water lines, power lines, all of the other kind of physical things that can be damaged. And then finally, populations. There are some communities that are going to be disproportionately impacted by some of the, pro the projected climate impacts. For example, in eastern Washington, Kids. if you have heat, um, it may disproportionately impact children, elderly, people who work outside, so farm workers, construction workers, is identifying those populations most likely to be vulnerable to the projected impacts. But again, this is just identifying who and what might be impacted. Just a yes, no. So pretty simple. The next step is to say, okay, well, it doesn't matter. Um, so yes, this roadway may be impacted. How big a deal is that? And one thing I want to point out here is when I say the preliminary for GHG reduction is to get as many people at the table as possible, Identifying potential impacts for a community require that you have as many members of your community and your city government at the table. This is emergency managers, your chamber of commerce, any of your local NGOs, community groups, utilities, transportation, housing, long range planning, to have them at the table because what you need to do is accurately assess basically how big a deal is this impact for us and it'll be different in each community. So temporal extent. How long is the impact going to last? Is it a flood water that's going to go over a roadway and then go away and then the road's usable again? Or is it flood water that's going to destroy the road? Those are very different impacts. Um, so that's permanence as well, so spatial extent. Um, is some portion of your local population endangered? And then just how disrupted is normal community function? Just rate it low, medium, and high. Sometimes there's often this, this need to have down to decimal points, kinds of estimates. And the challenge with a lot of this is that you have this ripple effect of consequences that you can't know with high levels of certainty. For example, in agricultural areas, you have shifts in seasons. Can you truly, with accuracy, identify exactly how much that might impact productivity? No, not really. Could you estimate? Could you put a dollar value on potential risk? Yes, but can you absolutely with confidence say exactly this much? No. And so you can, you can get ballpark though and decide whether or not it's a low, medium, or high. The next thing you should look at is what are you already doing? Um, which is adaptive capacity. Adaptation overlaps to a great extent with hazards planning. So a lot of communities already have strategies for fire, for flooding. If they already have strategies in place, you may, it may be just bolstering existing policy. Or you may realize we have a projected impact that we have nothing on the books and no strategies for dealing with. But this is one way of finding that out. And again, just low, medium, and high. What you can then do with that is you can use a decision matrix, um, which is one way of saying, OK, how big an impact, and then how able are we to deal with that impact? So San Francisco has 
three airports in the Bay Area that are projected to be underwater by the turn of the century. Even if unlikely, the disruption to the kind of the flow of goods and services into the city would be drastically disrupted if they lost any one of those airports or seaport, for example. So even it's going to be very high impact, even if it's rare. It's a little bit like Sandy. The impact is incredibly high. Even if it was unlikely, it's going to be one of these no-risk policies. There are some things that are worth taking some action. And what I'm going to close with is that the cities that have done a really good job and been successful at both adaptation and greenhouse gas emissions are cities that have institutionalized the idea. Um, they haven't made it about climate. Even in very forward-thinking, fairly liberal cities, they just make it about meeting community needs. So it stops being about climate and starts about meeting, a ne meeting immediate needs simultaneous with addressing long-term climate needs. And it should be. It should just be a normal part of decision making for all parts of city, city governance. Um, so climate planning is good planning. It just should be normal planning. And most of the communities that have done this well have actually found a way to institutionalize it where every department uses it as one factor in decision making. Um, it's got to be contextual. This is not a one-size-fits-all policy arena. The most effective actually tailor it to the needs and characteristics of their community. Um, crosses boundaries. A lot of times city governments are like universities and the other departments don't talk to each other. Um, they need to talk to each other and integrate. Um, involve the public and it's ongoing. One community who's been incredibly successful and we asked them how, they said, talk to the community because even if you have elected official and staff turnover, the community still <coughs> demands action and so we keep momentum. Because this is something that isn't you write a plan and you're done. It's something that takes prolonged effort and sustained progress. And so part of that is making sure that you do outreach throughout the process during plan development and all the way through implementation. Um, and that's actually a quote from the mayor of Homer, Alaska. He cast the deciding vote. It was a split council when they adopted their climate plan, um, which was, this is a good idea even if climate change wasn't an issue. It's just good planning. Um, and so with that, I will hand it off. You know, it's one of those uh, things that uh, isn't necessarily intuitive. The idea, I think we can all accept that uh, insurance uh, certainly reacts uh, to uh, uh, storms, to uh, extreme events, to catastrophes. Uh, clearly that's the case. Uh, the idea that insurance might be a part of doing something about it, uh, I don't think is quite as intuitive. Uh, part of the problem in our country uh, is that insurance is regulated entirely at the state level. And so the approach uh, can change depending on which state you're in. Uh, only one-fifth of all insurance regulators are elected. And those that are, you can expect to be more uh, accountable to the public, uh, which is the case here in the state of Washington uh, with Insurance Commissioner uh, Mike Kreidler. It's the case down in the state of California uh, with Insurance Commissioner Dave Jones. In a lot of states, uh, based on my experience uh, with the national organization, uh, because the insurance regulators are appointees of governors, uh, they tend to share the ideology of those governors and that uh, has not been uh, favorable uh, towards the idea of doing something about climate change. Uh, but insurance, uh, you would think um, of, of any product, uh, you know, it seems amazing that the idea of uh, climate change is something that you can't discuss in polite company. Uh, and yet, uh, at the same time, regardless of what is causing it, it seems undeniable, at least from a risk perspective, uh, that it's occurring. And that certainly is something that is uh, recognized uh, by insurance companies. Uh, primary insurance companies, um, the ones that you purchase your homeowner's insurance uh, from or that you uh, buy your uh, car insurance uh, from, aren't as inclined uh, to do anything uh, proactive about it because uh, their incentive is to uh, pay a dividend to their shareholders. Uh, their incentive is to live in this moment 
and uh, not really to uh, look ahead. In that sense, uh, insurance is very reactive. And yet insurance is also these days uh, based on very complex uh, modeling. It's uh, actuarially based. And so there's a lot of uh, aspects uh, to this that are quite uh, foreseeable. And um, there are what are called uh, reinsurers, which I'll get to, uh, which are actually uh, very cognizant uh, of the risk uh, because ultimately they're the ones who are going to be uh, left uh, holding the bag uh, at the end of the day. Uh, there was a report that now seems almost dated uh, that the insurance commissioner uh, wrote the introduction to that was a national report uh, issued in September about uh, climate change and uh, the dangers of extreme weather. And why I say it was dated is because at that point, uh, it looked like we weren't uh, on track uh, to be uh, on pace with uh, what other previous years had been in terms of the uh, cost uh, to primary insurers. And in fact, that was uh, noted within the report. Uh, we've been averaging around uh, $32 billion a, a year uh, due to extreme weather events that primary insurers have been paying for. Um, that figure is actually greater if you account for uh, reinsurance. Uh, and again, I'm gonna describe uh, reinsurance. It would be more like uh, $42 billion. And that's ignoring the fact that uh, government uh, ultimately is the insurer of last resort. And so when you see, uh, for example, uh, the president uh, proposing and the Senate uh, agreeing that uh, the, the cost of uh, Sandy's uh, cleanup is going to be uh, $60 billion, uh, you can consider yourselves uh, as taxpayers to be the insurer in that case. And so there would seem to be uh, some incentive to at least uh, acknowledge the reality of the consequences of climate change, even if at the same time we can disagree uh, perhaps about what's causing it. I'm sorry, I'm not as, uh, I, I used to be an Apple person, uh, but uh, I'm more uh, these days uh, using the uh, desktop computers. So what's uh, reinsurance? Reinsurance is really the uh, backstop for primary insurance. Uh, let's say you buy a policy through PEMCO, and PEMCO sells uh, 10,000 policies, each with a policy limit of uh, $1 million. In theory, at least, uh, they could be out uh, $10 billion if uh, every one of those policies was redeemed. Now, that's not going to happen, uh, but at the same time, you can't have liabilities on your books that exceed your assets. And so insurance companies actually go shopping for insurance, and they get insurance uh, to cover the risk that they're assuming from you. And uh, actually, this gets even more complicated um, where what are called uh, reinsurers, which are these uh, giant uh, European firms, uh, for the most part, with assets on the books of uh, $30 billion apiece, uh, Munich Re and uh, Swiss Re, uh, in turn go out and uh, they buy reinsurance uh, to cover their reinsurance of the primary insurance. And sometimes uh, this continues on uh, so long that you run the risk of the insurance uh, actually being covered by the primary insurer uh, that, uh, and that's called a spiral, and that's a very bad thing, and that's uh, not dissimilar to my son's uh, cat uh, chasing its tail, and you can imagine the economic consequences. But uh, there has been an acknowledgement on the part of the reinsurers, uh, because they are ultimately uh, not uh, obsessing as the primary insurers are about their responsibility to shareholders. Uh, they're paying the uh, freight uh, for those primary insurers, and so, when I say that extreme weather events cost the primary insurers uh, last uh, year uh, $32 billion, and then they cost the reinsurers uh, $10 billion, uh, they're not too happy about that. And so there's a lot of desire on the part of these reinsurers that there should be a conversation uh, about uh, climate change. And yet at the same time, uh, it's like anything else, as long as uh, there's a market uh, out there and uh, you know people can place a risk, and you and I can buy insurance and reinsurers can find reinsurance, uh, then uh, there might not be any change. But we're starting to see some signs uh, that there could actually be. Um, you know, here was something that was sort of discouraging, uh, and, and it's understandable from a political perspective, uh, which was discussed earlier, uh, but the fact that in the uh, face of uh, Sandy uh, coming, a lot of uh, governors uh, waived uh, what are called uh, wind deductibles, which are really an um, incentive uh, for you to 
uh, weatherproof uh, your property. Let's say you live on the coast and there's a possibility of, if not a hurricane, but because that wouldn't seem very likely on the east coast, uh, at least a tropical storm or some uh, risk of uh, wind damage, uh, paying a wind deductible at least gives you some skin in the game and uh, some incentive to do something about it. Uh, and yet these uh, governors actually waive that. And so uh, as a consequence, you're introducing a great deal of uncertainty into the marketplace uh, because there's always the possibility and rating risk that this could happen again, that governors are going to simply unilaterally uh, waive these deductibles and at least in some cases, uh, governors who don't actually believe in climate change. And so uh, as a consequence, uh, you're gonna end up uh, charging everybody more uh, in order to uh, make up uh, for that. And so in that sense, you're uh, socializing the risk and uh, through insurance, uh, you're really not getting at the root of the problem. But what gives you hope is that you see in the wake of Sandy, uh, the reinsurers uh, sort of asserting themselves more and trying to get the uh, primary insurers uh, to focus uh, more uh, on being uh, proactive about this issue and at least a uh, rating, uh, which was a recommendation of uh, the Ceres report that came out in September and uh, that the insurance commissioner, uh, Mike Kreidler here has signed off on, uh, at least rating the risk and uh, providing some incentive uh, for people to be proactive. Uh, again, this is the uh, conversation about uh, adapting at a minimum to risk uh, as opposed to uh, ameliorating it, which uh, I happen to believe we should do. Uh, we should try to uh, slow the pace, uh, if not reverse the pace, if that were possible, of climate change. But at a minimum, if you're paying for this risk, uh, you need to adapt and acknowledge uh, that change. So, you know, as I said, it, it has seemed as if uh, climate change is something that can't be discussed uh, in polite company. It's uh, one of these article of faith issues like uh, reproductive choice that is going to somehow uh, incite an argument. And so uh, those of us who believe it's occurring, uh, you know, dare not uh, talk about it uh, for fear that somebody's going to say it's just eccentricities in the Earth's orbit or this always happens or, or whatever. But there's nothing like a hurricane to just change your attitude about this. And so, uh, as the New York Times uh, reported, uh, even a, a majority, or I would say a plurality, of uh, Republicans uh, in the state of New York uh, believe that the hurricane uh, there was caused by climate change. And so, uh, I think you start to see an awakening uh, in these um, communities where these events have happened. And, uh, you know, part of it is uh, quantifying the risk uh, because we always see these uh, debates uh, in insurance, and you may recall this uh, from tort reform, for example, and other debates uh, where there's a lot of anecdotal uh, debates. Uh, you know, what, what are the real facts here? What are the payouts, you know, for uh, medical liability, for example? And so one of the things that we as a state are trying to do with New York, uh, even before this in California, is uh, quantify some of the risk that is being borne by you as policyholders and by your primary insurers. And although we're just three states, uh, because insurance companies cross state lines, and obviously with a state like California or New York, we're actually able to pick up almost all primary insurers, um, except for those who are very, uh, very regionalized uh, in terms of our uh, reporting. And so this will give us a little bit more of a clue uh, as to what to do here. Again, uh, the federal cost of Sandy, uh, $60 billion uh, to taxpayers. Uh, if we're not gonna prevent uh, risk, uh, we need to at least adapt to risk. And I, I include a couple of quotes uh, from articles in the uh, Star-Ledger in uh, New Jersey and uh, the New York Times in which there is this conversation about uh, federal flood insurance and uh, the sort of uh, disincentive to be proactive uh, when it comes to some of these uh, risks. And uh, I've seen them in my county, uh, Thurston County, uh, the southern part. Uh, we had rain, you know, lots of rain last week and uh, they start to close roads down there and um, pretty soon uh, there's flooding on the floodplain down there. Uh, which uh, has houses on it, uh, as it does uh, down in uh, Lewis County, uh, further south. 
and uh, we start to see these 100-year uh, storms uh, happening more frequently and, uh, and then the effects not just on people but on commerce. Uh, Interstate 5 closing, for example, uh, businesses being affected, the state making a huge investment of resources uh, to prevent water from coming over Interstate 5 in a county in which uh, people are very conservative and uh, ostensibly hate the government. Uh, but at the same time are looking for a significant infusion of your cash uh, to do something about this issue. So as the uh, New Yorker, uh, you know, has really been, uh, I think their first uh, piece or lead off piece uh, following the re-election of the president was a necessity of, uh, of addressing climate change uh, because we're the proverbial frog uh, boiling in the pot of water. Uh, but, uh, you know, at a minimum, just from the perspective of disaster economics, uh, you have to acknowledge uh, what this uh, cost is uh, to our infrastructure. And so I think that there's a role, kind of a dark horse role in all of this, uh, for insurance uh, to actually be a part of this conversation, to actually change behavior. Uh, because at the end of the day, we can all debate um, about our articles of faith, and to some extent, uh, because we're untouched by these issues personally, uh, you know, that, that's okay. I mean, but uh, at the end of the day, everyone here is going to bear some cost uh, through insurance uh, or as a taxpayer uh, for the costs of climate change. And uh, if enough of an imperative exists at the regulatory level uh, to do something about this and to actually rate the risk, uh, we might actually start to see some change. Thank you. And by the way, in our area, it's okay to be a desktop guy. I hear there are a lot of Microsoft folks around. I don't know. Well, Brendan talked about insurance and maybe the uh, behavior change impact that handing someone the bill can have. That changes your behavior. But uh, Casey Golden has worked in both the government sector as well as, of course, in the uh, non-governmental sector uh, with Climate Solutions. And he's going to talk a bit about how the policy environment may be changing in some ways faster than we think and in other ways perhaps a little slower than we'd like. Andy, thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you for your great presentation and for bailing me out with mine. Um, and uh, big, big huge thanks to Town Hall and to Island Press, Denise and, and Trudy Inslee, who's here. Um, this is a, we are a patient, idea-oriented people in this town. And um, it is amazing to all be here on a Thursday night uh, going through this so, so assiduously. It's one of the things I love about, um, about Seattle. But I, I sort of realized somewhere along the line that I used to be a policy wonk. I was kind of trained as a policy wonk. And I've been kind of making a transition toward being just more, a little bit more of a hand-waving evangelist about this, because I sort of feel like um, the policy, uh, I feel like we can figure out the policy stuff. We haven't really figured out the story and um, the cultural narrative around all this stuff yet, so I find myself wrestling with that a little bit more. And I thought, especially since we had such a terrific presentation, a really um, kind of amazing how much information um, Adrian was able to uh, put out in a way that didn't feel too dense and impressive. It was really terrific. And that leaves me even more room to wave my hands and talk about the communications and psychology of this. So I'm just going to do that for a minute before we go to Q&A. Whoever came up with the name global warming for this issue um, did us all a terrific disservice. It's, um, it is, uh, you know, of course, it accurately describes the trend in the global average temperature, and that's why it was chosen. But nobody lives in the global average temperature. Nobody works or plays or gets anything done in the global average temperature. So, you know, from day one, we start talking about this issue, and it feels incredibly remote and inaccessible and out of anyone's jurisdiction. Well, that turns out to be a big problem. But when you really start to think in concrete terms, and again, Adrian did a terrific job of describing this, about what the issue really is, uh, it is very much, at the end of the day, a local issue. When you think about how the impacts hit, uh, and this is exactly what Brendan was just describing on I-5 in one of those 100-year storms that now seems to come every three or four years or so. Uh, it's very much a local phenomenon. We don't experience the global average temperature. We do experience these kind of impacts. 
as local hits. When you think about how we cause the problem, it's very much the product of our local decisions about transportation and energy infrastructure, as Adrian described. And most of all, when you really begin to roll up your sleeves and think in concrete terms about how we're going to tackle this thing, um, both in terms of how we solve the overall problem globally, ultimately, and in terms of how we adapt our communities, the action is very much local. And uh, there's been an awful lot of it going on in this town. Um, so you can see it all around this town now. Um, I do not mean to say for a minute that we don't need a national policy or an international treaty. It is unforgivable, unconscionable that we alone in the advanced, among the world's advanced economies don't have a national climate policy. And no one in this room should sit still for that for a second. Having said that, you know, until we do, and even when we do, even after we have a national policy and an international climate treaty, it will still be true that the solutions are about what we do in our communities. Um, so the work that we're doing now is very much uh, part of building momentum for national and international solutions, and it's partly, you know, it's a big part of actually doing the do, no matter what happens at the national and international level. So we have been doing our Seattle climate action planning. Uh, we just finished a, a new set of recommendations, but I wanted to just quickly walk through the history. In 2000, we made the commitment to provide all of our energy in the city uh, with zero net greenhouse gases. We achieved that in 2005. And so I'm happy to say that all of the electricity used here tonight for this presentation and all of the electricity used here today in Seattle and all of the electricity that Seattle ever uses in the future will be coal free and net zero greenhouse gas emission uh, for, for our energy supply here in Seattle. Um, now you might say, oh, well, this is Seattle and it's different, but it is not coincidental that we also have some of the lowest energy rates uh, in the nation and we have some of the cleanest air in the nation. So it's not as though we're paying some terrible sacrifice and price in terms of our lifestyle to have achieved this goal where our energy system is the envy of the country. A lot of it came with long-term hydropower investments. There's not a lot more hydropower we can do, but there's plenty more long-term investment in renewable energy for any city who wants to do it. I should also say it's just a huge advantage in Seattle that we own our own utility and can actually do this. Um, Puget Sound Energy is also a terrific utility, works in um, communities across, uh, across the region and is doing awesome work on energy efficiency um, and renewable energy. But it is when you do the local climate action plan, not very many of those cities on that map actually own their utility. And so much of what Seattle has been able to do is because we have that, that very big arrow in our quiver. In 2005, uh, we, Mayor Nichols uh, adopted the Kyoto Protocol in Seattle out of frustration, frankly, that our federal government had not adopted it. That was the year that Kyoto went into effect internationally when it finally got over the hump. Remember, it was negotiated in 1997. 2005 was when it became uh, global law minus the world's largest emitter. Uh, and Mayor Nichols, in frustration with that, decided to adopt it as a city. Um, he then challenged other mayors to do it, which is when the U.S. Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement was born. And he and I went to the international negotiations with that map you showed in Montreal in 2005. And his sort of punchline for that map when we arrived at the negotiations was, there is intelligent life in America. <laughs> We just completed the recommendations for the 2012 Green Ribbon Commission report, announced them up at the Bullet Building. Uh, the mayor and the council will now be looking them over and hopefully adopting all of them verbatim without, without a word of change. Um, they are, uh, as you might imagine, in these sectors similar to how um, Adrian broke it down, the, the conventional sectors for the most part. There are some terrific new innovations. I won't go over the plan if, if in Q&A people want to go into that. It's available on the web and it's uh, yet another big step forward for Seattle. But I think another big piece, piece of it is that you know, we did our homework. We looked at the emission sectors. We did all the things Adrian described. But we also really took a strong look at what does this mean for us as people? Um, how big is this challenge? How bold do we need to be? How do we need to integrate this into our thinking about how Seattle should look and feel and what kind of place it should be? How do we do all these things in ways that promote our equity goals throughout the community? How do we, you know, integrate systems thinking and price carbon and some of it? So the, when you read the document, I hope what you'll find is it's a 
technically sound local climate action plan, but it's also a pretty good um, uh, spirit raiser and manifesto for what kind of community we want to be and what kind of energy we want to bring to this challenge. Um, now, every one of those 200 plus mayors who have adopted one, I bet you, has faced a question from a skeptical reporter or somebody in the community saying, well, it's great that we have a local climate action plan, but you're not going to solve ocean acidification. We could reduce our emissions to zero. It would have no, you know, your point oh 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 one of global emissions. Um, surely this is symbolic. This is just a payback for your green friends and a feel-good thing for liberal Seattleites, right? That, that question is always asked. And in a way, it's the global warming question in a nutshell because um, it's, that's the scale challenge. Any one actor, of course, is much too small to solve the whole problem. So is this local action just symbolic? Um, you know, we can talk more about the collaboration with other cities. I have to say that when the rest of the world has been waiting for this country, the world's largest historic emitter, the world's largest economy, to step up to its rightful role as a leader in the global transition, uh, they're getting pretty impatient about that. And the fact that they can see that all these forward-looking cities in the U.S. are moving forward actually helps sustain momentum in the rest of the world because they know that they can't do it alone either. So this kind of local action, believe me, is heard around the world and is part of sending those collaborative signals we all need to send as global citizens about our willingness to solve this at a time when our federal government has conspicuously failed to send those signals. But the other important thing about it is we're building um, not just a plan to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, you know, when you say it's a global problem, people always say, you know, whatever we do, China and India are surely going to swamp our emissions and render it irrelevant. Well, it's true, mathematically. So what are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about all those emissions all over the developing world and the fast-growing economies? Well, we can't very well say to those people, sorry, the atmosphere is already full of the emissions that created our prosperity, so you're out of luck. Um, what we can do and what they're only too eager to have us do is pioneer a different path to prosperity, a path that can work for the long haul, a sustainable prosperity. And when I say sustainable, I mean it not just in the conventional environmental sense, that it works for a long time, but also in the sense that it can work for a lot more people in this country and around the world, including the roughly two billion people who have never known the kinds of economic opportunities that people in this room do. They are going to seek those economic opportunities on the best path available to them, and we should in no way deny that. What we should do is because we have the resources, because we have the advantages, because we put most of the carbon up there already, we should pioneer a path to prosperity that works for us for the long haul and works for all the people who aspire to what we have. That is, in fact, what we've been doing in Seattle and Portland and many of those other cities that are taking the lead. It's not just reducing our emissions. It's pioneering that pathway to prosperity, and it's why local action is so important. How many people have seen this cartoon before? Um, <laughs> This, this has become sort of a staple of um, climate action presentations <laughs> around the world. And it's great. We love it. It's funny. And it also illustrates a key point. Adrian touched on it a little bit. It's often called in the literature co-benefits. And it's the idea, hey, it's good planning anyway. You know, if we do all this stuff, if we reduce our emissions, if we provide more transportation choices, it's just going to make for a fundamentally better place to live in so many ways. Co-benefits is kind of the name it goes by. We are climate solutions. We talk about co-benefits all the time. Co-benefits are great. They open doors that would otherwise slam in your face if you were just beating people over the head with climate. Um, they help you articulate a vision of a fundamentally better future, which is a big part of this because people have a hard time doing it just to reduce their carbon footprints or just to save people who are going to f live 50 years from now. But there is a problem with our over-reliance on this, and I want to challenge our thinking about this a little bit. Um, there's some really interesting psychological research, you can read about it on my blog, Grip on Climate, um, that shows that talking exclusively about co-benefits, about all the good things that are going to come to us because we did the right thing on climate, it deactivates moral intuition. It says, this isn't a right or wrong issue because my pitch to you is, do this because it's going to feel good. Well, if my pitch to you is, do it because it's going to feel good, then you might infer, well, yeah, if it doesn't feel that good, I'll do something else. 
It's not really something we have to do, it's optional. And of course, rising to the climate challenge at the end of the day is not optional. It really is a moral challenge for our generation. And so how do we get that sense of you know, hope and building bridges and a better community while not saying or implying that it's optional? Well, when it comes to these kind of communication challenges, I always turn to Mr. Churchill. And you may remember that one of the landmarks, one of the true uh, you know, uh, famous moments in the history of motivational speeches was when Churchill was trying to bring Great Britain into World War II. Everyone was very reluctant. There was a lot of denial and obfuscation and all that kind of stuff. And this is what he said. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. I imagine that he might have also said something like this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, so think about the psychology of this. He's trying to activate moral intuition. He's trying to say, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. There's nothing good about this. What I'm trying to tell you is we have no options left. This is an imperative. And in order to make that point so effectively that we all remember this speech, he stripped away all the co-benefits and just made it as ugly and painful as he could in order to illustrate the point that it was an imperative. And so we have to somehow work with that because we, it's not enough to tell people it's gonna feel good when you reduce your carbon footprint a little bit. We are never gonna to get to climate stabilization that way. We have to somehow collectively get around to the idea that it's an imperative. I don't actually have the solution for this conundrum. I struggle with it. Maybe you can advise me in, in q and I'm no Churchill. Um, I'm gonna keep selling co-benefits. But we also have to really think about how to challenge ourselves and challenge the people we talk to about this to understand this as the imperative it, it is. Uh, it really isn't optional. And then finally, the other little psychological challenge that I want to raise is um, this, I guess, I just stole this, ripped it off of Google Images. It's somebody's book cover. You probably know it, Adrian. I hadn't read it. But, um, you know, this is obviously, Adrian is, of course, absolutely right. We absolutely need to do both. The impacts are upon us. And if we don't mitigate, if we don't reduce emissions, if we don't stabilize the climate, what are we even going to, we don't even know what to adapt to. There was a great story on NPR this morning about New York's adaptation, and they were saying, well, we're going to build the seawall, but then how high are we going to build the seawall? Well, you don't know that until you stabilize the climate and stop the sea level rise. Um, so, and, you know, I have to say, without being too dour, because it bumps people out, that the emission scenario on the right that you described, the full tilt boogie emission scenario, forget about adaptation. Really, there's not a lot left at that point. So we have this imperative to mitigate, to stabilize emissions so we have something left to, and we absolutely have to engage in mitigation. But the psychologies of those two things are pretty different. People have a hard time holding two fundamentally different windows on a challenge. And there is a tendency to want to choose to say, is this the kind of thing we got to stop? Or is this the kind of thing, kind of thing we got to kind of figure out how to live with? And I, just to caricature those two psychologies, I ripped off these two images from the web. Um, it is hard to hold. These are different emotional dispositions. They're different ways of feeling and understanding and assimilating a problem. And one of our challenges is we have to get into both those moods at the same time. I don't mean to, of course, the, it's not necessarily the right image for the adaptation one. Um, but I, <laughs> I'm sorry, Adrian, <laughs> probably. Um, but, but I really do think there, there is this, this challenge going forward um, and that there is a tendency, I saw it after Sandy, where people said, whoa, all that time we were thinking about this, now, holy crap, we, now we, we better scramble to adapt because it's too late, right? Well, it is too late to avoid a certain amount of damage. It's not too late to avoid a world that we have no idea to adapt to. And that's the challenge that we have to accept even as we adapt, we've got to avoid what we can't adapt to. And I'll leave you just with this quote, just to get your dander up a little bit, because it, it sure did with me. The US Chamber of Commerce submitted comments on EPA's greenhouse gas mitigation rule, and they said populations can acclimatize. We don't need to reduce greenhouse gases. We can acclimatize by a range of behavioral and physiological and technological adaptations. Well, I have to say that into my mid-50s, there are some things about my physiology that I would change if I could. 
but I'll be damned if I'm going to adapt my physiology to the commercial requirements of the fossil fuel industry so the U.S. Chamber can serve, can continue to serve those folks. This is the kind of thing where we have to get up a different kind of spirit, the kind of spirit you saw at the, uh, the coal export rally today. It's got to be a can-do spirit. To be honest, it's got to be a fighting spirit. This is a political issue. Uh, there are sides in it, and we have to stand up and fight that issue even as we adapt and even as we show what it looks like to be the solution in our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you.